Welcome to the Donahue Group. We're glad you could join us for another episode. Coming on the heels of the uh, April nonpartisan election, we have lots of interesting things to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to ask our group to go around and, and introduce ourselves. Cal, do you want to start? Cal Potter. Uh, I live in the town of Sheboygan Falls. Uh, occupation, uh, mostly retired. <laughs> Very good. Tom Podesky, professor of math at UW Sheboygan, a uh, former alderman. Uh, I'm Ken Risto. I'm the Social Studies Curriculum Assessment Specialist for the Sheboygan Area School District and teach at South part-time. And uh, I'm, as I always say, just a simple city lawyer. So, uh, <laughs> it's so true. Uh, we're, uh, as I indicated, we're just after the uh, April nonpartisan elections uh, here in uh, Sheboygan County, and there was just one statewide race, so there wasn't a whole lot of state interest, a uh, couple referenda, but uh, certainly an interesting race here in Sheboygan. Um, we have a new mayor, or we will have a new mayor as of April 18th, and quite a change in the, in the, in the city of Sheboygan City Council. Who wants to start? Well, I, I think of local races, there probably were two areas that people kind of focused on. One was the town of Sheboygan Falls. Mm -hmm. Sheboygan wanting to see whether the Walmart uh, mm -hmm. uh, long-standing debate uh, had any eff effect on the town chairman as well as the uh, incumbent town members, board members who had voted for the, uh, to go ahead with the project. And then of course the, the city of Sheboygan where uh, the focal point was another sort of uh, project and that was the police station being located in Sheridan Park. So I think both of those provided intense interest and we saw a fairly decent voter turnout as a result of it compared to some uh, spring elections, about 41% in the city. I didn't see what it was in, in the town as far as a turnout is concerned. But, uh, well, when you contrast that particularly in the city with the 16% uh, turnout yes. uh, uh, in the primary. Yeah. I thought the aldermanic race results were fascinating. Going into Tuesday night, I would not have thought that Mike Werner could be beat. Um, I thought Renee Susha had run a pretty spirited campaign against Don Van Akron, but at least in my household, there was a phone call from Terry Van Akron, his son, urging me to vote or urging our household to vote for, for Don. Um, and um, uh, the third race escapes me right at this point. Um, those were interesting Radke. results. Radke. 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 Radke, Jeff Radke. Jeff Radke. Uh, now, Gary Laux, he beat Gary Laux. Gary had not been on the uh, council very long, um, but I think was pretty much associated with the, clearly a supporter of the mayor and a supporter of putting the police station in Sheridan Park. And that, I mean, Radke won handily. I think you've got statistics there, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. We, if, yeah. Clean sweep? Is the, anybody wanna take a bite on that? Well, you know, the, the Sheridan Park issue brought a lot of people to the council and not only through the referendum by signing the petitions, but they actually showed up in meetings and wanted to speak. And uh, I think, and I've watched a couple of the council meetings, it seemed like the council discounted the people in the audience. They wouldn't let them speak or let them speak only very briefly, if not at all. And they said, that opinion's been already said. We don't want to hear anybody else saying that and kind of shut down just, and that probably also, uh, one of my colleagues at the campus said, that council in Alderman uh, Warner uh, typified that, unfortunately, uh, probably energized these people to say, hey, we don't need that. And that sort of was one of the basis of uh, Juan Perez's. Uh, uh, it didn't surprise me a bit. I, I if I interacted in any way with anybody who was an existing uh, administration person, I would say, you know, there's a semi coming right at you, and <laughs> you just better not stand in the middle of the road. It's not a smart <laughs> thing to do. do. And being a non-resident of the city, you know, you get to sense from people what their feelings are when you're talking with them, and I think I could be somewhat very objective in doing that, and I just saw one when I saw the three council members uh, change, as well as the mayor, it didn't surprise me a bit. Yeah. Well, I was surprised. <clears throat> I thought it was gonna be a, a little bit closer. I thought it was gonna be a really close race because, you know, we talked about it in a couple episodes back about, you know, in, in the primary, you have lots of people unhappy that tend to turn out the vote, but then when the general election comes, you begin to wonder, well, now how is it gonna play out? 
Mm -hmm. I was kind of playing around with numbers here, the ones that the press put out this morning. And um, what was interesting is that net, you know, you subtract. Actually, uh, Juan uh, Perez turned out almost about 800 more voters than, uh, than the mayor supporters did. Each, uh, the mayor ran about, got about 3,100 more, more votes. Uh, from the primary to the general election, and and uh, Juan Perez turned out about 3,800. You know, so um, hmm. boy, I mean, you would think that so clearly more people got energized by the campaign, or maybe the weather was a little bit better. Who only who, who only yeah, knows? It was good weather. Um, but but that's what surprised me. I thought that you know obviously uh, Juan would gain some votes by the other candidates who were eliminated by the primary. They later came out for him, a couple hundred votes here and there, but he was able to still generate some even even more support. I don't know if that's because of the uh, ethanol issue, which gave people hope that Juan would probably tend to listen to people more often, um, or not. But it was, uh, and I just didn't know politically how everything was going to take place because um, how were labor, you know, how were employees, city employees, and labor going to vote? You know, Juan Perez has always been sort of you know connected with the labor movement. On the other hand. Uh, Mayor Schramm had some real support among uh, unions as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was just looking at the numbers, and what I find I find interesting was, and it was almost dramatic, is that you know you've got Susha, Meyer, and Ratke. You know, obviously three people who weren't considered or not going to be considered the former mayor supporters. They're going to be on the board, uh, but whether they're going to agree with Juan Perez about everything, well, it remains to be seen. Yeah. But as I, you know, Juan Juan Perez got more votes in those aldermanic districts than the winners of those aldermanic districts got in their own districts. Um, in the Susha, uh, in, in uh, aldermanic ward two, Susha got about 85 votes less. So even though there's this, I mean, the, the, so the support for Juan was even stronger than the support for, if you will, uh, the, the change agents mm -hmm. in those. Yeah. And even in uh, uh, ward, ward one, uh, Alderman Berg got 973 votes and Juan Perez got 986. So you know, you walk in there with a pretty strong constituency, a base of support. And that was a ward that, that was a particularly interesting ward because um, uh, Perez had lost that in the primary. Uh, he, mm -hmm. had, um, he had uh, won in the second ward, okay. I believe, but had, had lost the first ward, which is the, you know, the far north, northeast, uh, northeast yeah. side. Yeah. And so that was, that was really a pretty strong showing. Uh, and then you also have um, just new people, um, uh, Jean Davis is uh, new to the council. I believe Jean was on the county board yes. for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, but he was unopposed. Um, and um, uh, Marilyn Montemayor is back, uh, uh, you know, unopposed. Um, Groff came through okay, uh, but I think the new people will. Well, Groff's employer, uh, Groff, Groff's uh, uh, opponent dropped out with about what, a week to go or something like that. Found out right. there wasn't any differences between he and. He and uh, Mike, so why am I running? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And there was one other unopposed uh, spot that I am uh, uh, blanking on again. No, I don't think so. The, the, the two that I had for my Kittleson notes were the Davis Kittleson race and the That was a race. Yeah, yeah. yeah Kittleson had a race, and um, Kittleson, a new appointee, generally viewed as being favorable to the mayor. So, um, so it'll be Although very. Although she signed the letter to the editor uh, supporting Jim Schramm. Right. I mean the, the old mayor, oh. yes, and um, so I think I think it's a whole new ball game. Uh, and I, I think, think there was more than one issue. I, I think you know, Kim was surprised at the, the the victory of how broad it was, but I think Sheridan Park is by far the number one issue. But I don't think that uh, storm sewer fee. Uh, want any yeah. converts either. I mean, it might yeah. be necessary because of the the budget crunch and so on. But there were particularly churches and nonprofit groups who were not too happy with getting a bill like that all of a sudden, uh, that particularly mm -hmm. if you're a large institution, it, it, yeah. was, a, it was a chunk of change that they didn't have in their, in, in their kitty and they were not real happy about it. Um, and I think we talked before we went on a program of a number of mayors, uh, particularly to the south of here in some suburban Milwaukee area, incumbent mayors who lost their jobs. Yeah. And I would suspect <coughs> that, I wouldn't doubt that uh, there was a lot of anti-property tax uh, feeling amongst people. It is a regressive tax. It is a difficult tax. I mean, particularly when houses today are averaged, what, $250,000. I mean, you know, you're, it's not uncommon for people to have four or $5,000 uh, property tax bills, and those are 
those are, if you're of any age, you have a number of miles under your belt in life, uh, you can remember the time when your property tax bill was $500 or 1000 and all of a sudden 5000 is a lot of sticker shock for some people. And so while other prices in society and price of cars and homes and everything have gone up, well, it's tough to relate to a property tax bill that you get that's, you know, As big thousand. as your mortgage. That's right. That's <laughs> so, right. so I think, you know, there's always going to be that, as long as we have the property tax as a dominant tax in Wisconsin, it's going to be an a, a albatross around uh, mayors and people in public office. So I, th I think uh, that rang true with some people. Some people. And we I had, we had a couple other issues that were, you know, the Sheridan Park kind of was the straw. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was the uh, attorney's fee on the Blue Harbor yes. that created an issue for a while. Then there was the rush to do Blue Harbor to make PGA kind of thing, and it just kind of bypassed people again in the, the attorney's fee. We just bypassed people, you know, look into it. Uh, so a couple issues on community kinds of, you know, getting the community involved. Well, and building and on it, that, I think for me it was a real eye-opener um, <clears throat> to just get a little bit more information about the uh, approaching the, the city debt limit uh, where the city is in terms of, um, in one of the pieces of literature I got, I had a graph, which I'm going to presume is correct, of a you know, fairly dramatic increase Great. in the last few years in that debt limit. Now, the city has imposed a 3% instead of the maximum statutorily yeah. allowed 5% uh, uh, ceiling uh, uh, on its debt, but there's not a whole lot more money to borrow unless the yeah. city decides that it will go back to that 5% instead of that good 3% that it held itself to. And those are, I mean, not only are taxes really quite high, but the debt load is, is, is pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. And So there were more <clears throat> issues, I think, in the city right. than in the town of Sheboygan. Uh, Sheboygan, where the town chairman was reelected, yeah, and uh, yeah, one yeah. of the supervisors who voted for the Walmart was reelected. I think one incumbent lost what five votes, um, mm -hmm. and then of course they expanded their board. And I don't know the feelings of the, the new board members, but yeah. there wasn't a groundswell to throw the bums out, so to speak, in the town of Sheboygan, because yeah. I think the, the the issue was uh, not in my backyard issue with Walmart particularly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right that there's lots of things at play, but what what Perez was really able to do and to do well was really send two messages, both of which are very general, almost vague-like, that people ap appeal to. Uh, so he's not in a box when he comes in, uh, certainly. You know, there were a lot of whole specifics beyond talking about a very general budget prioritization process. Um, you know, first of all was the, the, the park issue, which has tapped into the fact that people felt that city government wasn't responsible anymore. We talked about that. Uh, and that's so there's sort of a kind of a populist uh, issue. And when you look at some of the wards, you know, where he was really, really strong, the, the north side, especially the northeast side and, and far northwest side, tremendous strength uh, there. That's where his big margins are. You know, Ward 2, he had 59% of the vote in that ward. You know? <laughs> My ward. Yeah. And then the park, and then not just surprisingly. And that's, still, and that's a big improvement uh, as well from the primary. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the Perez yeah. won the, the Ward 2 in the primary, but not, as my memory, but not by any we're near that amount. Well, I was trying to think of his constituency. You know, Juan was on the school board. He had a lot of people in, but with children in school, and also the teachers knew Juan, knew what kind of person he was. Then I was thinking, and he was uh, educated. Uh, so he has a little background, uh, you know, so he brings some education, uh, and maybe might appeal to some business people uh, who are looking for uh, a person with uh, 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 that they could talk to and reason with. And then he worked out here at the university, so there I know there were some students uh, uh, certainly supporting him and probably helping him, so he picked up a little, some maybe youth supporters. Uh, so I was trying to, and then I'm assuming, and I, I don't know, that he might have had some minority, uh, the minority of vote. So I was trying to decide where, where his support would come before looking at numbers, you know, yeah. just where it would come. The, the supports are clearly all the way across the board. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, he, you know, yeah. he went almost every ward. Uh, one is Ty, and there's the, where the, the, the mayor, the current mayor, lives, and where the police department may be located. Uh, he lost in that ward, but not Other by much. Not by much. Yeah, you know, yeah. but, but now, when you look at the park, the park ward five, you know, 60% of the vote goes to 
you know, to Perez. You know, so you could see that the people in that neighborhood certainly were generated. Mm -hmm. And I think he, I think he's really raised expectations. I mean, he's, he, like I said, he had two messages. He had the first one, and the second one was one of really fiscal responsibility and fiscal yeah. prudence, which appeals to a whole sure, different set of sure. voters. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see how that's going to play out because he wasn't ever forced in the campaign. The mayor, the current mayor tried to, you know, time to, if we get rid of the sewer fee tax, well, we're going to lose 50, you know, X number of city jobs, and, of course, then try to play into, you know, concerns about unemployment among certain, you know, try to, how do you, but that never really stuck, you know, so he was able to say we're going to do this, and, and the money's there, and we're going to do budget prioritization, and um, he kind of reminds me of uh, how, you know, FDR got away with 1932 with basically sounding like a fiscal responsible person and, and, not, and not being, and, and being not, you know, just being very general and not being tied to anything. Um, so don't you think, though, I mean, the state of American politics these days is that if you do put out a specific proposal, yeah. um, then... Uh, it's microanalyzed to uh, the point uh, that you exactly. become almost yeah. discredited and you try to do something that people expect you to do, you know, give answers, be very specific, but and I, and you know, I think we generate this, our own yeah. you know, an image of candidates. And I think it just goes to a, a, a different issue as well, because I did have people come up to me and say, well, you know, what is Perez specifically, mm -hmm. you know, proposing and so forth? And I don't, like you say, Ken, I don't think there were a lot of specific proposals, but no. I think what most people were looking for was a leader, mm -hmm. and a leader mm -hmm. who would listen and you know, as George, the first George Bush would say, that vision thing. And I think that the vision that, that Perez was able to articulate, people are willing to say, well, let's fill in the details later. Well, and I just think he's raised expectations up dramatically from a wide variety of different people. I think the ethanol neighborhood concerns, I think they think they have a friend in City Hall now. I think people think that uh, city taxes are going to be dramatically improved and there's going to be some real fiscal restraints and I think he's got you know that's that's you know the nature of running for elections you, you try to generate support and get yourself a coalition to get elected and then you get the job and you say oh boy how, how am I going to meet all these expectations he's got a, with a with a with a city council that you know in the past has really supported the previous uh, mayor you know, but you mentioned ethanol but still the plan commission already made a recommendation on the site and said no yeah. So it's not like, uh, whereas the, in the Sheridan, in the police station, the plan commission recommended the 23rd Street site. So already you have, uh, you know, one of the commissions of the city was pushing 23rd Street site or saying that was a better site yeah. versus the park. Yeah. Well, I think... Now the ethanol yeah. site, they're saying, no, this is not what we want to, how to want the city to grow. Yeah. But building on what Ken said, I, I think it is true that what a brutal job. You know, in part you want to say to whoever is running for mayor, What's wrong with you? <laughs> this is an impossible job because the squeeze from both sides is so intense um, that I. I uh, if you have an open, which I think he touched on, you know, having an open government, you're never going to have a consensus. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you, you plea, you. It's how you relate to the people. How you will relate be helpful. to the people. They could yes. say, I don't agree with you, but you treated me fairly. Right, and you listened. <laughs> and you listened. And we had a process. But I still think you're wrong. wrong. But, I, but I don't hate you for it. I don't hate you. For it. That's, That's right. right. That's right. And I, it, and then just segueing back, and that with respect to that, I think in the town of Sheboygan there was certainly lots of opportunity and time for discussion. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think the difference there was just the specter of of city annexation. Now I don't know if that would have happened, or I mean, I think people who weren't in the immediate. Um, lights of the Walmart parking lot, um, I think eventually saw this as something as a boon. I mean, this is going to be many millions of dollars in development. It's going to be help their tax, tax well, base. Well, surely tax helps the so tax base. So once you start base, yeah. getting six blocks away, away. you know, it's, it starts taking on a little different, I think, uh, viewpoint, unless you're just very much anti-Walmart due to their lawsuits and labor practices or whatever else mm -hmm. people don't like Walmart for. But I, I think that that was a distinct difference, whereas I think the Sheridan Park issue uh, rang intense whether you lived on North 23rd Street or South 23rd Street, you, you felt something about a park. Walmart, I think, had a little different dimension because people who were impacted negatively by the traffic or whatever would have a lot different intensity yeah. about it than somebody who's a mile away. Well, and, and now that that season is over, and now we start to watch to see, you know, what, what 
rabbit is pulled out of the hat or what miracle of loaves and fishes there might be. Uh, the signs come down and all the letters to the editor, which I found to be, no matter what side you were on, hugely entertaining. Really <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you open the, open a, the, the newspaper up and say, now who's going to have what idea about this? And of course, we have some favorite letter writers who are just funny, funny to read and, and, and express themselves uh, in a pretty idiosyncratic way, but it's kind of fun. So that's all over. So we kind of get back to a dull political season. Speaking of which, on the, on the state level, the Burmaster-Underheim race was less underwhelming. than... Uh, underwhelming. <laughs> underwhelming, yeah. thank you. Uh, less than exciting. You used to work with uh, Libby Burmaster. Yes, she um, was my boss for a number of years. And, uh, here's a, a fairly liberal woman who, I mean, I think you could characterize... Yeah, she, she makes no bones of the fact that she supported uh, the, the, in, in the presidential race, uh, the Kerry Edwards ticket. And she supports she, the governor, Governor Doyle. And here she wins 60% of, yeah. uh, <clears throat> of, uh, of the vote in Sheboygan County. Which is and she did very well statewide. I think mm -hmm. part of it is the fact that she was a very strong educator uh, background, uh, whereas uh, Greg Underheim, who I served with in, in the state legislature, um, spent many years, he, I think he began his work life in a teaching capacity, but then went to work for uh, Congressman Petri, and then after that uh, ran for the legislature. So he's really been more, you know, most of his work life has been in a sort of a elective uh, mm -hmm. arena, and I think people, I think when they think who are they going to have as the overseer of their child's education, uh, felt comfortable with someone who's had, you know, almost 40 years maybe of, of experience in some form of education, who was a third generation teacher in her family, versus uh, Greg Underheim, who, who really I don't didn't didn't think articulated education issues very well in this campaign. Well, not at all. You know, he, he really got off on uh, whether she supported a property tax freeze and sort of almost sort of issues that are more are legislative more than they are mm -hmm. uh, the state superintendent, which is an administrative post. And so I, I think uh, he did not do a very. I think he tried to get some hot button issues going, such as property taxes. But I think people are sophisticated enough. Uh, to realize that the state superintendent's job doesn't control your property tax, and uh, they saw through that. Interestingly enough, the commercials, the TV commercials, um, funded by the Wisconsin Education Association Council. I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us why. Well, <laughs> I mean, they were pretty. I, well, they, it was a pretty. The, the, the one ad that, that I, I, the, I saw. I thought the ad was, was pathetic. And there was just one, right? I yeah, only saw one. Yeah, it was just one. the one. I don't I even mean, know which one you're talking about. Well, it's, it's it talking about. So you watched any kind of? Yeah, if you watched any kind of NCAA basketball over over the uh, weekend, I got back from break, and um, there was only the one. And you know, the first part of it was fine. You know, she did. You know, Wisconsin schools are fine. We, you know, our our students do the best for this and that and everything else, and uh, was a strong. And that was fine. Then of course we shoot to the black and white and this kind of you know insidious little person mm -hmm. sitting there, and you know. What I found pathetic was is is that we and I you know I can say this because these are my people. Um, we act doesn't have the courage of their convictions. They never have. And they, these, if what was the two things they criticized him for? One was because he wanted to write. He made a proposal somewhere along the way to write off uh, gambling, gambling losses. losses on, yeah. What you know talk about something that's got nothing to do with education. You know, um, talk about not. And yeah, the second one, and the second one was he voted against, I think, reduced childhood, which was an education reduced issue. Reduced class size right. funding. Yeah. But why didn't we, act, you know, put on the board? Well, you know, this guy's against the QEO. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, because we don't want to. If, if this guy's against the QEO, we're actually going to generate more votes. And mm -hmm. so I found the whole the whole ad just disingenuous. And um, and, and, and the other thing, I don't think the Republican Party even put up a fight. They didn't. I mean, no, they didn't spend a I nickel. Didn't, I didn't no, see, no. and it wasn't was, any kind of counter ad. I was somewhat surprised by that, but I guess yeah. they probably did their polling data and saw that they didn't need to spend yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars on a race that they weren't going to win. That they weren't yeah. going to win. So, yeah. so it's offensive that we, Act Me, spent a fairly substantial sum of money. The last time I mm -hmm. read was just under $400,000 yeah. on, on that really stupid TV ad. Yeah. I mean, it was scurrilous and, and did not advance any kind of reasoned discussion. So, so of course it was a political ad. <laughs> it met the definition per se. There were also some uh, referenda on the, um, yes. on the ballot, and um, I was glad that I 
had read in advance what they were going to be about. Um, so you could understand them? I walked into the <laughs> polling booth in Ward 2 and they said, don't forget there's a referendum. And I said, referendum? <laughs> I did not even know there were referendum on the ballot. Well, one that has been slogged about forever is to change uh, a number of elected offices from a, a two-year to a four-year cycle. Which was strongly supported by the voters, which I think yeah. appreciation that, that every two years for many of these administrative offices is not something that we ought to put the, these folks through. And which in many respects should not be partisan elections. Yeah. I mean, we go back to the clerk of courts and the register of deeds and mm -hmm. coroner, coroner and, and uh, even the district attorney. Mm -hmm. I, uh, from my perspective, who cares if the district attorney is a Republican or Democrat? So I, and I understand that those were sort of from the old days in terms of, of supporting and preserving political parties, but I think that's changed. So, so I think the four-year uh, four decision is a good one. And then, again, we're subjected to fewer of those ads. And, and, uh, and then in the Fourth of July parade, you'll have fewer and fewer <laughs> of the officials coming Oh, I love back. that, though. So that'll be a little benefit. <laughs> I, always loved, I always loved Jim Sensenbrenner coming on our... <laughs> Pray because he always had on great sneakers and then kind of like but a little parking vest. He still has a two-year <laughs> term, but you won't see. But the we don't see him change. anymore. Yeah, you won't. You won't. Yeah, you won't see him, the, yeah, the register of deeds coming. But I always down liked his green little, outfit. His little bib that he wore. You know, I always thought it must be Tootsie Rolls or something in there. But uh, yeah. uh, no, those I'm sure will remain as as two-year. And I know you, having been both a two-year and a four-year elected official, um, I think you told me once that you four years is a lot. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, easier well, really, on the yeah, soul. You, because you actually start campaigning with circulation of papers in June, so you actually are in office a year and a half, and then you're circulating papers mm -hmm. again. So, and with the cost of elections today, it, it, it's really something that ought to should have been changed many years mm -hmm. ago. We just have a couple minutes left, but uh, the kind of the the fun throwaway referenda on the Sheboygan County ballots about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the state assuming the costs of mandated human services and also the um, court system. Um, the state currently pays for judges and, and I believe, DAs. And, and DAs and court reporters, but the county pays for the buildings and the support staff and so forth. Uh, as I was watching the votes come in last night in the administration building, um, it seemed to me that the vote was 89, 90% <laughs> in favor. And <laughs> will it, have it make any difference? I, oh, it's not, you know. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no, it's got to come, it comes around. Teacher, the economics <laughs> teacher, you know, everybody says, oh yeah, let the state pay it as if we're not the state. state yeah. Uh, so, okay, the state's going to pay it. Well, it's a way of probably being more equitably spending this kind of money across districts which have different you know, levels of economic development. So it might be a little fair and it might make, it might make some sense. Well, and certainly in income tax yeah. systems can be structured sure. more flexibly, I think, than property mm. tax. Yes, right. And income. so it probably would make some sense to do that. Um, the question becomes when you start changing physical plants, when you want to add on and, you know, more courtrooms and things. There's a tendency if, if somebody else is paying the piper uh, to start yeah, doing those start kinds of things. Those things right. And so you'll end up, just like with school districts, making commitments to uh, the state to fund school districts. Uh, they found very early on, well, we're not necessarily going to fund capital and improvements because pretty soon uh, everybody's, you know, building their buildings. But so will it change anything? It's up to the legislature. Yeah. The legislature has really kind of made these referendums uh, exist. It's the county level people who have said, we can't take your mandated uh, mm -hmm. passage of requirements on us yeah. and you don't pay for them. Therefore, let's ask the people if you want us to, you want the state to stop, but the state stops, or does isn't stopping because they don't have any money either. Exactly. They've been, they've been exactly. in debt. And so as a result, you're gonna have to have a, a uh, whole different uh, mindset on the state legislators' part to start saying uh, we owe it to the local folks to pick up the stuff we mandate, and, and they haven't been actually yeah. been fulfilling that well, in recent years. The election is over, and uh, we won't have election topics to talk about for a few more months. But I'm sure that in uh, future episodes we'll have lots of interesting uh, uh, issues coming up. Uh, uh, those Voter rascals ID. in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> Voter ID is, uh, is interesting to me. So thanks for being with us, and uh, we'll be together again soon. Thank you. Thank you.